Hello, Isaac. Rabbi, good afternoon. How are you? I am doing wonderful. Thank you for asking. Uh, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever. Uh, amen. Uh, it's very funny, you know, whenever we read uh, more than one verse or more than two verses the day before, a lot mm -hmm. of times we don't get to anything. So yesterday we read three verses very, very optimistically. Uh, uh -huh. we, we finished one. And today, wow, um, 217 oh, is, is yeah. short, 218. Uh, I have a question from yesterday, you know, I have a sure. question from, 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 a, from a conversation yesterday. Now, I appreciate what you said, how um, the folks who first heard this, that, you know, again, the, uh, the, the author wanted to show parallels between the life of Jesus or the birth of Jesus and the birth of Moses to show that somebody bigger than Moses was here. I had not, again, I had not heard that before, so I went back home late, uh, late last night. Um, who knows if it's true? We, I read the passage what again. Had, what we say here, Isaac, has its own truth. Yeah. So, so here's my question, right? So, um, when you read the earlier verses right, or, or the, the 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 earlier section, the child flees from Israel into Egypt, uh, you know. And last week we discussed where uh, the um, the Torah had explicit the, the Torah had an explicit commandment that a Jew should not live in Egypt. Now, my, my the one takeaway was the patriarchs, the all the, the patriarchs back in the back in their time, they all moved from Israel into Egypt in some way, shape, or form, or they you know. And so and so, what's the author right in these in the in the past? Are these few verses trying to show that that yes, we had a patriarchs and we had Moses, and here's this. You know, here, This person called Jesus to kind of remind him of the patriarchs, and in his breath and in, 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 in Herod wanting to kill this child, it's like um, you know, it's like it's like Moses. So my here's my question: Did the author really mean like what are the like when people would have heard this right in these in these broad brushes, uh, move, the movie from Egypt from Israel to Egypt and this would they have felt enraged about this that the author was trying to make comparisons between the uh, between again between Jesus and Moses and Abraham and and, or, and the patriarchs and secondly. Uh, I'm surprised that he doesn't call again in verses like in the section, right? Verses 13 or verses 12 from nine onwards. It's it's uh, Jesus is not called by name. He's just called the child, right? So, no. um, okay, good question. So, uh, I, I did point out that the prohibition to live in Egypt, definitely, while it's written in the Bible several times, it may not have been viewed as legalistic in the first century. So I don't. I, I brought. I just brought that up as an observation when we were doing the text. Like, oh, by the way, this this prohibition prescription exists. But uh, as we noted, a Philo of Alexandria, who uh, preceded Jesus by a couple decades, and other communities from the you know obviously the Elephantine communities and others, and uh, they, they, so I don't think they took that prohibition as law, and so much so again, like I, I think most people don't take it as law today. But the idea of having a new Moses, which if anything is anathema. To most of Judaism, mm -hmm. uh, you just you have to you have to say something like that. If Jesus is going to be more important than uh, a previous prophet, you have to g give some justification. And the justification in this situation is Son of God, Messiah, or whatever. You know, um, you have to say that. So um, the fact that we're choosing to categorize it as a new Moses is just our choice. And it looks like the Matthew the evangel the evangelist from from Matthew, that's how he views it. So um, I, I just think that's how we were forced to view it. I'm intrigued. So why is he called evangelist? Was his focus to evangelize people? Uh, I, I think, this? no, I think, uh, I, I'm pretty sure um, uh, evangelist is just the word that we use for an author of a gospel. I see. Um, okay. But I, I, I'll be honest, you know, um, that's what I think. <laughs> uh, we can look it up. Uh, I, usually I call the Matthew community the author of Matthew mm -hmm. or the evangelist. So... Um, evangelist yeah that right spreader of the good word and the good news so you're saying that so you're saying that in this passage uh, there is no parallel between uh, uh, the author is not trying to to to, to weave a parallel be between the patriarchs and jesus the patriarchs well, well, the patriarchs again like not necessarily the fact again the, the fact that he we're, we're not talking so much about the theology or the metaphysics about like we could talk about that why would someone need to go into exile and then come back from exile into your land. You know, when we talk about, you know, redemption theology or exile theology, so you could say that Jesus could not have been a Messiah without experiencing an exile. 
And the fact that he was, you know, this is already like another kind of level that we, I generally don't go towards about hypothesizing about the metaphysics of how to create a proper uh, messianic psychology. You know, um, Freud would say that Jesus had to go into exile in order to understand the, you know, you could go that route. Um, and, and I would have no problem with that. If we heard someone say, Jesus needs to experience exile because he'll know that millions and billions okay, of so, people yeah. in the future will feel that. that that's a good point. No, I, I don't think that's my question. My question was, the, you know, the, uh, the, the early readers of this gospel, how would they have felt about this? Like, you know, these, you know, these, these insinuations that he is like Moses or that he's going to exile in, into Egypt. So I don't know. Right? Again, like, would this have enraged them or uh, would this have made them go, wow? Or would this, so, you know, make them... I mean, I'm going to give you a bad answer, but I think no matter what you have that, which we talked about before, is that you need to justify Jesus' existence as being a greater prophet than, than Moses. Because if the end of the Bible is true, the last verse in Deuteronomy says that no, no, no prophet will rise like Moses. And yet, Christianity very, very clearly states and, and, and proclaims that a greater prophet, is Jesus even a prophet? Like, I don't know, right? Is he talking? If Jesus is God, is he just talking to himself? You know, like, I don't know if we call Jesus a prophet. That's like a whole other question. But a greater human being arose than, than Moses, according to Christian uh, tradition. So you have to go and talk about that. And you can't, you can't, can't just throw it under the rug. So I think the fact that the, the gospel chooses to have this conversation with the Jewish community and the future Christian communities is, is honest and it's realistic. Um, and again, if you're not going to buy into, like, if you start and say, God cannot, be, Jesus cannot be the son of God, then this is not for you. This is not the right book. We're talking about certain assumptions that we uh, take for granted. And again, that's why I think, I, again, like you could you compare the different way the gospel started and how Matthew starts with the, the child's uh, community. Okay, sorry, just bring an email. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So on that note, thank you. Thanks for clarifying. So it's two, chapter two, verse 18. Uh, 17 and 18, yeah. 17 and 18, okay. The gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 2, verse 17 onwards. Then was fulfilled what was, pro what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in, in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentations, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. Okay, we're, we're going to go piece by piece breaking this. There's, there's so much happening. Wow, it's gonna okay. Take, it's it's going to take us a while to get through, through this quote. Okay, another wow. prophecy fulfillment. Wonderful. So is this um, really a prophecy? Now, this is what I meant to say, right? So it's, it's, so it's not so much that... It's not. He, it's not a prophecy. This is more about this is more about he trying to make sense. Like you know, so let's let's go back to when this happened. This is back in the days of Jeremiah when King King Nebuchadnezzar came invaded invaded Israel, and so uh, as a way to comfort the people, he said, "This is like Rachel weeping." You now, like when when Rachel was weeping for the children to be comforted, they are no more. Uh, Isaac, I feel like you're you're very focused on is this or is this not a prophecy fulfillment? And the yeah. answer is, as opposed to some of the earlier ones, this definitely was not viewed as a okay. future prophecy Oops. that needs to be fulfilled mm -hmm. and yet and yet the Matthew community views this as a, a, a well so you it's a form of prophecy granted. yeah it's i mean it's it's a form of prophetic verse but it's not exactly because it said so something should happen it's more about using it's, it's more about using the language of a prophet to, to understand what's happening right now and to give people a sense of hope a sense of you know a sense of continuity with with, with, with what's happened in the past you know, so, so that's definitely a, a possibility, but I think it's a little bit stronger than that. Okay. Uh, I think all these prophecy fulfillments, as we mentioned in the past, have to do with if their idea of prophecy and the idea of God interacting in human history is to exist and continue to exist and to be such the highest level in human history is under Jesus. And if that's the case, then you have to argue that the Jews at that time have the creative abilities to also create, make sure that the Old Testament and the whole Bible in general stays relevant. And that relevancy is what they're showing. It's not only, which we'll break this down soon, it's not only that Rachel or whoever's crying at some place, it's that the cr creativity of the Jewish community slash Christian community at the time is allowed because the Bible is contemporaneous. And that's the argument. It's like, it's really changing the way the Jews in the first century viewed the Bible as the past and they meant to, they're meant to uphold it. 
the Jews of the Christian community want to view the Bible as not the past, but something they're living in that moment. There's a new Testament coming. There's a new universe coming that they have to keep uh, it going. So I think their creativity is an expression of the contemporaneous relationship that they are supposed to experience of God. Okay, that's okay. That's uh, a, that's a great way. You know, that's that, that's a great way to look at it. So, so why? So the, the, the Old Testament has so many prophecies. Like why this one? Right? There's so much of violence. There's so much uh, so of you know, comfort. Um, it, it's why this one, and it's gonna be. I don't know if you like this answer. The answer is because this one sounds perfect for the situation. <laughs> that's perfect. why. Perfect. Uh, we'll, we'll have a, listen, before we so let, let's break down what's happening. So make sure we understand the prophecy. And then we'll go back to say, why is this a good prophecy? Okay. okay. So let's start. A voice is heard in Ramah. Where is Ramah? Good question, Isaac. So Ramah is one of two things. Ramah in Hebrew, the word Ram just means high. It can refer to a mountain. It can refer to a height. It could refer to speaking from a, a pedestal that's on top of a mountain down. Or there's also a city called Ramah mentioned many times in uh, Tanakh in the Bible. And the city of Ramah is north of Jerusalem, and it's near Rachel's grave. So on the one hand, we're going to have to argue, I, I don't have, personally have an opinion, does the verse from Jeremiah and or the verse from the New Testament refer to Ramah, the city north of Jerusalem, not south of Beth, near Bethlehem? It seems very hard to argue that. Or does it refer, refer to the point that Ramah, this place on high, a voice is heard, and almost I feel where in, in, in Jeremiah, it refers to probably the city, because it's probably the city where the Assyrians took the people captive and off into the east. But over here, it probably refers to like, in the Testament, you say like, oh, Rachel is in heaven. She's heard on high. So that's probably along the lines of what you could say it means. But then we have a question, right? Uh, why Rachel? I Rachel Rachel and Jeremiah is viewed as the mother of uh, Benjamin and Joseph, Joseph, the father of Ephraim and Manasseh. And therefore, he's the father of the, the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom was already destroyed. So she's crying for her, the northern kingdom to be destroyed. And Jeremiah, it makes perfect sense. Over okay, here, okay, though, so okay, so this so this is not about Judah. This is not about a descendant of Judah. This is more to do with being being a descendant of Benjamin, right? Judah uh, yeah, and Benjamin. So generally, uh, Rachel will be the matriarch. I mean, Rachel. Like, uh, this is gonna sound funny. I, my daughter has a song that they play on YouTube sometime where it talks about uh, Mama La Rachel. Like, Rachel of all the matriarchs is viewed uh, of all of them. Rachel, I'd say, is the most viewed as our grandmother in the Jewish world today, in, in 2020. Okay, so, so uh, the, um, the grandmothers are Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, and Rachel. Yeah, and possibly, yeah. So those are the four matriarchs. Yeah. While Sarah is the starter, Rivka is the middle one, Rachel and Leah are the two sisters. Yeah. I'd say Rachel is viewed most as our, like, if, if one okay, would now, really think about say that's the one who's viewed most as a grandmother. Now, isn't this a big, isn't this a bit different? Like, the chapter one was about Judah, was about the promise made to Judah, and David is, again, David is a descendant of Judah, and now we've, we've, we've moved from Judah to, to, to well, Benjamin. We're, we're, again, we're, we're stuck with this Ramah line. Because if it's the ge geography of Ramah, then I, I think we're problematic. But I think the person who wrote the gospel um, would have probably, uh, this is going to sound really weak, but Ramah, Ephrat, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, it's all roughly the same. Like, you know, they're all within 15 miles of one another. <laughs> so I think that uh, it's very easy to view that mountain range in that area. The Judean Mount, the Judean Hills, right there, as like you know one general geography, and I think that Ramah is using this uh, ambiguous uh, sense that uh, it's the place where sadness is, is coming out because it's uh, it just means this area. So Ramah would have been on the northern line. It's still viewed as part of Judea here. Again, it's not the it's not the strongest answer, but I really think it's the honest answer about why they're saying it. That Rachel, our our, our foremother, our matriarch calling out from on high mm -hmm. and crying over the fact that her children are, are dying. So, so, think, so, yeah. so, so you're saying that Rachel is viewed as the, you know, like off the four blood for us. The, so why? So, she's the one who, who would cry for us. So Sarah why? What is about like, yeah, again, I, and I, I'm not speaking for first century Jews. I'm speaking for 21st century Jews. I see. For example, in, in Israel today, no one visits, uh, like Leah, like no one, formally visits Leah. No one, I, even though you could go to Leah, Leah's grave, no one, for, no one knows where Re 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 Rebecca is. Rachel's tomb is something that, that you visit. It's so something what about you it? So yeah, so it's something what that about has a physical it? manifestation. Okay, so what about Rachel? Like why, like, I, I'm, I'm intrigued, like, you know, like, 
what's so special about her, or why, or why does why why does she occupy this place, or this um, this special I, place? I don't, I, don't, I don't know the answer. I feel like I could give you a hundred answers because I don't know the answer. Okay. There's so many different. Uh, I, I, again, I just feel like Sarah a lot of times is viewed as almost ethereal. She's like this different level with Abraham. Rivka is like the, the Rebecca is the level. Rachel is like the one that's down to earth, the one who, who, who cried for her children, the one who did everything for her two children. If you think like, what did Sarah do for, for Isaac? She kicked away uh, Ishmael. What did, what did Rivka do? She got rid of Asaph. What did Rachel do? Rachel died in childbirth doing anything. She, all she wanted to do is more for the, Israel, for the Israelite people. She wanted a second child. She need, you know, do you know what Joseph means? Joseph, Yosef, the name Joseph means more, add more. The very fact that she had one kid, she asked for more. So I think a lot of times she's viewed as the person who, yeah. who, who intervenes in history, who, who's trying to do stuff for us. So again, this is completely, this is just thinking out loud. It sounds like Rachel's life was marked by suffering. And again, she was marked by suffering and pain or the form of grief. And, 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 and out of that, she prayed quite a bit. And so she occupies a, a special place. Was the evangelist and the author of Matthew was he trying to make connections between the person of Jesus and the person of Rachel in the sense that this is probably come further down the pipe, I mean, further down the chapters where Jesus is also viewed uh, as, is viewed as, um, as a suffering servant, uh, as one who went through suffering. Well, I, so I, have, I have no problem making that parallel. You know, uh, it's very hard to know how off the text we should get. Okay. Definitely um, you who knows what's to be in the, in the forthcoming chapters <laughs> of math, you can make that. And I definitely agree Rachel suffered, but I think yeah. uh, Re 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 Rebecca suffered. She, she couldn't have a kid for 20 years. Leah suffered that she was the hated wife. Sarah suffered that she, she had a, uh, a co-wife who, who was making sad. So I think like the lot of women overall from matriarchs are going to suffering. Did Rachel suffer the most? I would have no problem if you said that. Um, but you know, it's hard for us to judge suffering. No, I mean, I, I'm just surprised that that uh, that Rachel, that uh, again, she's viewed in, in uh, she's viewed with uh, or she occupies um, a very special place in people's hearts and in, in people's heart. Yeah, uh, so and, Rachel, and, and it's interesting. Uh, the verse not only says that she she's crying, she's lamenting, is a great mourning, but then it says she's weeping for and would not be comforted because they are not. And I think like because they are not, because they cease to exist. Uh, again, like when you read this verse to someone who is, who is uh, knowledgeable of Jeremiah would have been like, wow, like I, I just feel like you have a, a dead matriarch, even that time, feeling empathy, sympathy, sadness, mourning, grief for her grandkids who are, who are getting slaughtered. So I think it just, it, it's too good to, to, to not cite. It, it feels like the right thing at the right time. If you know, uh, what do we say, like 20, 30 people got killed in Bethlehem, let's say. Um, it just it just fits. So that's that, that's why uh, I I would say it's here. Okay. Well, I I was um, this is my first time looking at this looking at this verse through, through the lens of Jeremiah, and then to know that it, it's a prophecy, but not so much as I said so. So this should happen. This because something he said so this should happen. It's more about. Jeremiah, Jeremiah said this when people were suffering back in the days when King, King Nebuchadnezzar, and so now again, there was this, this amount of grief, grief for the loss of life, right? People being, again, these kids who, kids who were killed by Herod. And so the evangelist, again, wanted to weave a story combining, um, you know, the, the old verses of comfort, and in, in that is also grounded uh, in a, a prophetic or it grounds the person of Jesus, the birth of Jesus in the, in, in some of the Old Testament prophecies. Now here's my, here's the, as you keep talking about, you know, the, uh, the Jewish community and, and, and they wanted to ground the person of Jesus in prophecy, like there is no direct mention of the, of the promise or any kind of promise made to Abraham or to, to David. Well, right? because, the only promises we have are the opening lineages, which I guess are, you know, where we assume. Yeah, but that's not that, direct, right? It just says Jesus Christ, again, the, the book of genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David and son of Abraham. But it doesn't, it doesn't explicitly mention the promise, right? It's more, it's more implicit. Well, I mean, that. tell me if I'm wrong. Does anyone think that the promise of Abraham, at least like initially, was getting fulfilled through the Christian community. I have no doubt saying that's true now, and you know, spread the word and everything. Well, okay, so but the first, the isn't first that the Jews, basis of Pauline? Isn't that the basis of Paul's gospel? One hundred percent. I understand, but Messianic Judaism 
is not, I don't really see that as a fulfillment of the Abrahamic uh, pr uh, promises. The promises to Abraham were what? Like you, you'll multiply, your name will be, uh, your blessing will be blessed, your curse will be cursed. I don't think that, that you could associate that with messianism, but it's not necessary. Like to say that there'll be a universal peace, that's not a promise to Abraham. To say that there'll be a figure who'll come, who will bring the world together. Like, I, I just feel like the messianic promises aren't necessarily, uh, co they don't necessarily coalesce with the Abrahamic promises, though they could. So I don't see that as a, uh, I, don't, I don't personally see messianism as a fulfillment of the Abrahamic promises. I see messianism as a fulfillment of prophetic prophecies in the writing and the prophets. Like in the whole Old Testament, what you have like hints at best of messianism, but um, there's really no direct verse in the Pentateuch where you say that, oh, wow, that, that there's a Messiah is going to come. You have like a star, will, a scepter will be born, you know, but you don't really see uh, the, the, the overt day of, day of God, day of the Lord in the five books of Moses. Yeah. Now, this is where me being a good Christian, I'm just going to say yes, you know, because I, I don't, I'm not that well versed in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament books. Well, I'm, I'm, you, not, necessarily, you know, I'm not necessarily and I, right. And I think, uh, you know, right. and I think, you know, you, you, you bring up a good point, right? Christianity should be grounded, should, should be grounded in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament prophets. And, and, and every time Christians, we look at Jesus as the starting point, we miss the base of who he was and, 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 and who he went and who, uh, and who unless he, you're part of the Martian community, right? Martian, yeah. Okay, Isaac, this was that, a great, great uh, two, two verses today. Wow, amazing. <laughs> well, okay, I think we're making progress. I look forward to starting the next section, you know, the, the next, the, the next oh, section tomorrow. Herod's gone. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, let's, okay, let's see it happen. so on the topic of Herod, just one last question, right? So, so what he did was bad. Like what he did was, was morally, ethically evil. I get that. But then is, is that, is him, is he a definition of your king? Like, is, is he, he the definition? definition of what? Is he is he the the definition or the embodiment of a Jewish king? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I definitely feel in the New Testament he's the embodiment of evilness. A hundred percent, he's supposed to be viewed that way. Uh, is he the embodiment of a Jewish king? I, I mean, I don't know what that means. David is the embodiment of a Jewish king. Solomon is the embodiment of a Jewish king, and certain others. But uh, Herod is the you know post Bible uh, from post, post Old Testament. So he's the embodiment of uh, the new contemporaneous bad guys that Jesus has to fight. You know, he's part of the Pontius Pilate and the, and the Pharisees. He's part of, you know, he, one of the adversaries of uh, Jesus during his life. Okay. Okay. Well, on that note, Rabbi, thank you. Thanks for your, thanks for your time. Look okay, forward you to looking, look for, looking forward to tomorrow. Thank you. Bye.